So for quite a while now I've been meaning to do a couple of videos on the design of a flight control system. So this is completely from scratch and DIY, starting with the hardware design, doing the low level and high level software, all the way through to the higher level guidance, navigation and control algorithms. This flight control system is supposed to be used and going to be used on a completely autonomous drone or UAV, kind of the size of about two and a half meter wingspan and a fixed wing drone, even though this could be used on quadcopters, multicopters and similar vehicles. This first video is going to focus on the design of the hardware, so designing a suitable PCB with the right sensors and other interfaces, all the way from designing the schematic to, through to the routing and then also finally ordering the product and testing it and seeing if it performs as it should. You can see more details on the work I do at my website which is philsal.co.uk. So the aim is to design a complete flight control system from scratch. As I said this is hardware, software, control systems, navigation algorithms, ground control station just to name kind of the main parts. My interest lies in fixed-wing aircraft, even though I do meddle a bit in quadcopters, but the hardware shouldn't be limited. So it should work primarily for fixed-wing aircraft, but should be general enough so you can deploy it on a variety of different systems. My personal goal is to have a complete system consisting of standardized hardware and a basic but robust software framework. I want to have all the boilerplate code written for device drivers and interfaces and messaging, telemetry and so on, and I kind of just want to get on with the work of testing new and novel algorithms. You know, you might have an idea for new path following or path planning algorithm, you want to test that. You don't really want to mess around with writing low level software, like writing I squared C drivers and setting up certain peripherals. That work kind of wants to be done already. So the idea is have a basic platform where most things or everything runs and you can just actually focus on high level work. The prototype, kind of a version 0.01 if you will, is this board. So this board recently arrived, it, uh, I designed the hardware, thought of the layout, did the routing, which I also designed in KiCad, and then all of this, or had it manufactured in China, and also, also assembled. And it's recently arrived, and I've been doing tests, and this is the kind of prototype platform, hardware platform. I'm gonna kind of discuss what my thought process was. So first of all, I thought of what are the hardware requirements? What do I actually need on this board? I wanted a standard set of sensors, so an inertial measurement unit, which consists of gyroscopes, accelerometers. I wanted a magnetometer, which, even though it's, it's difficult to use because of magnetic field distortions, for a rough estimate of, of heading. Additionally, a barometer for altitude estimation. There's also a GPS receiver I would like for, for position and also altitude estimation. Um, possibly even a differential pressure sensor to measure airspeed. The hardware should also be able to have uh, expansion slots and interface capabilities. So for example, if you want to attach a radio or if you want to connect it to your computer, various other interfaces, other sensors, it should be able to do that as well. I didn't want a separate power distribution board for the servos, for example, to control ailerons or elevators and any other control surfaces. So I wanted to have that on the board as well. Essentially, you connect a, a LiPo battery and you get the voltage required for the sensors and microcontrollers, but also the approximately five volts and a high current requirements for various servos. Additionally, processing power was a thing I looked at. You kind of want enough that you can run high level algorithms on them and several at the same time or in series, but you don't of course want to increase the cost by too far and comp complexity. Finally, you also want to see, again, affordability. So how much will the system in total cost if you're just doing a single run or if you plan to do larger runs? The kind of block diagram I came up with as a first guess or first attempt is this. I divided the system into two parts. One is a navigation commuter or microcontroller which handles all the sensor interfacing, pulls them at a high rate, and then runs several cascaded Kalman filters to give an estimate of the aircraft's attitude and position. So for example, this navigation commuter is interfaced with IMU, the magnetometer, pressure sensor, GPS receiver as the main sensors. A second computer, the flight control computer, is then used to pull the final state estimates from the navigation computer and is thus offlo offloaded to the navigation computer. So it doesn't have to do all these high level or rather high frequency calculations. It can be concerned with other stuff. So it's a nice separation between the logic and the code. So kind of lower level stuff runs on navigation computer and high level control and navigation algorithms run here. 
The flight control computer is connected to current and a voltage sensor, so we can see the battery status and how far it's discharged, and also the power we are consuming at a moment in time. I also like a P PWM driver to be able to drive the servos and the main motor, or multiple motors for certain cases. Also, I wanted non-volatile memory in the form of EEPROMs and flashes. So EEPROMs to store certain parameters, for example, for the Kalman filters or controller gains. So when you restart the system, you don't have to reprogram it via telemetry, for example. The flash memory of the flight control computer is there for high-speed logging. Additionally, which is not directly shown here, is uh, some sort of power distribution. So we want a large input voltage range. I would like a 5 volt rail with a high maximum current for the servos and then also a 3.3 volt rail with up to 2 amps just so we have enough overhead for the navigation computer, flight control computer and peripherals and the sensors. Additionally, connectors. So to the outside world, if you want to connect a radio, if you want to connect an antenna, various servos also have to be interfaced in some way. And finally, to actually program the device or devices, we need some sort of extra connection. Now I chose serial wire debug and also DFU, which is Device Firmware Upgrade via USB, which is an STM32 feature. And also possibly UART to USB converters for some sort of debug output. The microcontrollers I chose for these are STM32, so ARM-based microcontrollers, which I would be programming in C. So once I've kind of thought of a higher level design, it's time to actually create the schematic for the design. I'm creating the, the hardware and the schematic design in KiCad, which is an open source software. The way I tend to create schematic is, is first of all, think of the high level design. So the block diagram, what do you want to roughly connect to what? Then first of all, start off choosing suitable microcontrollers. As I said before, I would want to choose STM32 because I'm fairly familiar with them and the kind of price versus performance is pretty good. The navigation computer is an STM32 F4 and the flight control computer I chose to be an STM32 H7 so slightly more powerful. I chose them because they have a large number of IOs, they've got several UARTs, they've got I squared Cs and so forth. They run at a high clock rate. They have dedicated floating point units and hardware, which is great for, for math heavy operations. Then after having chosen the microcontrollers, I wanted to choose suitable sensors. So I had to weigh up the costs, the kind of measurement ranges I would need, in terms of maybe G-forces or maximum rotation rates, and also how they perform in terms of their noise characteristics. After that, I chose peripherals and connectors. So I wanted several USB connectors for easy connection to the computer, IOs to connect radios, serial wire debug connectors, and to make things easier to use in practice, some, for example, indicator LEDs. If the microcontrollers are running, if we've got a GPS fix, if the battery is low, it's quite nice to have a direct indication of these things, not have to hook it up to a computer. Lastly, the power distribution. So think of what voltages are required, what currents, and select parts which are suitable for that. So I chose a switching regulator which takes uh, the large range of LiPo voltages, anywhere from 3 six to 6 cell batteries, steps it down to 5 volts, and it's I think about 90% efficient and up to, can deliver up to 9 amp amps. Following that there's a 3.3 volt regulator which can deliver up to 2 amps. The most important thing is that you follow the manufacturer's data sheets and application notes. They will usually give you guidance of what components to pick, as in external components that you need to use with certain ICs, where to place them on the board, and, in, and how to do certain calculations, so how to set the output voltages of regulators and so on. Additionally to the data sheets, there are also application notes which are very useful, for example on crystal oscillator design and how to choose the right loading capacitors and so forth. So once you've created the schematic and checked the schematic, you need to pick the physical parts. So these STM32 microcontrollers, for example, they might be called very similar, but they come in different parts. So they might be LQFP packages, they might be BGAs and so forth. You can get them different pins, so 64 pins, 100 pins, 144 pins and so forth. And that's across the board for ICs and resistors and capacitors and so on. You also have to consider the size of the board. So you don't want to make a huge board for a drone because you might want to fit it into a smaller one. The, the board I ended up making uh, for the first prototype is six centimeters by nine centimeters, so fairly small. Another question is who's assembling the board? If you're assembling it and you have limited gear at home, it might not be easy to assemble smaller, smaller components like 0201, 0402, and you might want to choose larger components just for the ease of soldering them on. You want to see what passive component sizes you want to choose, because there are going to be a lot of those capacitors. 
and it might be good to choose a standard set of only 042 or only 0603 because you can order them in bulk. IC packages, as I said before, they come in loads of different shapes and sizes, but it's a good idea to avoid BGA because they're very hard to sort on, even for PCB manufacturers. They'll usually charge more, they might not even offer it, and so forth. One big thing I found was actually choosing the right connectors. So there are, there are thousands or tens of or hundreds of thousands of connectors out there and finding the right one for your purpose that will fit the most people and it, it'll, it might not cost as much, that's, that's quite a hard thing. So it's, it's worth spending a bit of time on that. See what people in the industry use and what you feel comfortable with, what you maybe have lying around and then pick those. Common, for example, are these GPIO headers, which are 2.54 millimeter pitch and you'll probably have quite a lot of header cables lying around for that. But then again, they might not be the safest. They have no latching mechanism and could fall out during flight. So once you've picked the parts, you've done the schematic, it's time to lay out the PCB. First thing, of course, you need to decide is how many layers your PCB should be. In general, it's probably a good idea to go with a four layer PCB because it makes power connections and other routing quite a bit easier. And the extra cost is not usually that big that it should be a significant factor. Then you also have to choose the ordering of the layers. So typically you might want to signal layers at the top and the bottom of the PCB and power and ground in the middle. Then define your board dimensions. Look at the PCB edge. Do you want rounded corners? What dimensions do you want? Put in mounting holes first. That's quite important because once you've placed all the components and then you want mounting holes, that might be a bit cumbersome. Connectors should be placed ideally first as well along the board edges. Once you've done that, you can divide the board into several sections. For example, power, RF, analog and digital, to name a few. Special consideration to the layout should be given to special parts, for example RF, where you want controlled impedances, or oscillators, where you don't want any uh, signals running below crystals and you want to have separated ground planes and stuff like that. Try to do a rough component placement of the integrated circuits. Ideally you want them all on, on one side, as that makes um, the assembly cheaper and easier. Once you've done the rough placement of ICs, you can place passive and smaller components around them, Ideally, you want to do the decoupling capacitors first, close to the power pins of the relevant ICs. And once you've got a rough layout, you can kind of refine it through an iterative process. Again, the manufacturer's data sheets and application notes usually give you quite a good idea on how to place components around the relevant ICs. So now, given you've got a fairly decent placement, you can kind of minimize the, the routing lengths between components and connectors, it's time to actually perform the routing. First of all, you need to make sure that you check the PCB manufacturer's capabilities. So what are the minimum track widths? What are the minimum via sizes, track to track displacements and so forth? Once you have that, you can, in your PCB design program of choice, you can enter those and then for the design rule checks later on, that will be useful. So you can see if you have violated any of those. In general, you want wider tracks for higher currents. So that aids heat dissipation, it means the tracks can carry higher currents. And you kind of want to avoid thin traces. If you can make a trace thicker, it's probably a good idea to do it. Route the important signals first. So for example, the crystal connections to the microcontrollers, the RF lines and differential USB, anything which is kind of more important than like a GPIO on LED. For RF signals, you need to use uh, the PCB manufacturer stack up specs so see the layer, layer dimensions, what materials they're using, dielectric constants, and so on. And then you can just use an online impedance calculator, which you can Google, put in the, those dimensions, the characteristic impedance you want, which will probably be 50 ohms, and it'll give you a track width, which you then put into your PCB program, and you can route, for example, a 50 ohm track. I tend to route the smaller power and ground traces last, so not the kind of the heavy duty power converter regulator tracks, but for example, certain power traces from ICs. I'll keep them to the end and then just lead them out with a little um, trace and drill myself down with a via and connect to one of the power or ground planes. The final touch is then doing the copper pause and doing the stitching vias. Once you've done your routing and you're happy with the way it's routed, make sure everything's connected, do a design rule check, both the schematic and the layout again. Just make sure everything's connected, you haven't violated any of the PCB manufacturer's specs and capabilities. Um, print out the schematic is what I tend to do and just check it by hand. Just without a computer, maybe take a day off and then come back to it with a clear mind and check is everything connected correctly, are the component values right. Again, use the data sheets as reference. Once you're happy, generate Gerber's, check with Gerber viewer, and just see, are the planes really connected? Are there no islands? And stuff like that. So once you're happy with that, 
upload to the manufacturer's website, filling the settings and order. Of course, if you're doing, planning on doing assembly with a PCB manufacturer, you'll need further files, such as a bill of materials or centroid file and so forth. Then, hopefully, maybe weeks or days will pass and you'll, well, you get the hardware in the mail. First thing to do before you power anything on is just double check the component placement values if it's been assembled, or of course, you assemble it yourself. Check for shorts as well. Just check if the power lines and ground lines are in some way connected together. Watch out for ESD, so make sure you're, you're always grounded, you, you're wearing maybe an ESD bracelet. Once you're happy with all the components and that there's no shorts, attach a power supply at zero volts and slowly ramp up the voltage to your operating voltage. You'll quickly see if there is a short and you haven't checked for it that there will be a large current. For these kind of boards you're only expecting the order of milliamps of current. So if there's a large current you'll probably have a short. And it's a good way of checking, not immediately applying, for example, 25 volts to the board. Check the voltages and check the current you're on. As I said before, for a board like this you'll probably only expect a couple of milliamps or tens of milliamps. So once you're happy with that, you can check other voltage levels, check if the oscillators are running, check uh, the outputs of the dropper uh, LDOs or regulators, and make sure just approximately that the voltages are there. And then one by one, you can write drivers for the sensors, peripherals, and so on to test them and see if they're working. So this can be a bit of a tedious process because you're going to have to write the drivers one by one, test it out if there are errors, check for that. So it'll, it'll take a bit of time. Now, when you do find errors, which you'll probably inev inevitably happen with electronics. Note them down, but don't change the original design files because that board you have in hand, you want a reference to how it was and not how you've changed it. So do make a copy. So this was kind of induction introduction to the hardware. Uh, after this slide, I'm going to go over through the actual hardware design in KiCad and just show you a bit about that. So the kind of few videos to come and things I've been working on, I want to kind of show in a video or a couple. Uh, low-level firmware, so how I wrote the device drivers and interfaces. The signal processing, how you do filtering, like FIR and IR filters, and how to choose appropriate bandwidths and things like that, and cutoff points. I wrote uh, my own te telemetry and messaging protocol, so how do you reliably transmit data, over, for example, a radio link, or even just from the, the hardware to the host computer, for example. Another video is going to be on state estimation on Kalman filters, how do you take these noisy and maybe inaccurate sensor readings and combine several of them together to maybe give you an updated or better estimate of an aircraft's attitude or, or, or position. Aircraft modeling control system design implementation will be another video or section where you actually take an example aircraft, create the model, mathematical model of it, dynamic model, and then aim to design a control system, a digital controller, uh, to stabilize that aircraft or to be able to, you want to set a desired pitch angle and it'll go to that pitch angle. And then also how do we implement that in code? Once all that kind of low level stuff is done, we can move on to high level firmware, for example, the state machine, guidance algorithms, and things like that, autonomous start and landing, waypoint of following and so on. Also I've written a ground control station, which is a base station which essentially runs on a laptop, which is connected via radio link to the drone. The drone relays information to the ground control station and you have a moving map and you can visualize things and so forth. So let's move over to KiCad and I'll show you kind of a bit of what I've done. Okay, so first of all, just looking at the schematic briefly. I've created several sheets, named them appropriately. So I might have a power section here where I have the input connectors, maybe a, a current and voltage measurement device and the main buck regulator and an LDO. And I do similar things, so I've got my sheets usually lined down here, where I have a flight control computer, the peripherals, the navigation computer, peripherals, and connections. So everything is grouped, and appropriate, I've, I've noted down which data sheets I've used, what I need, what I don't need, apply appropriate labels, just to make sure if I look at this maybe in a year's time, um, you know, that I can understand it still, if I haven't looked at it for a while. So it's always good just, if you can annotate something with something useful, I would, I would suggest you do it. Okay, and then once you've done that, you can annotate the components in KiCad, you do an electrical rules check, you assign the PCB footprints to schematic symbols, and then you create a netlist. And once you've created the netlist, you go over to routing. So the final routed board for this first version is this. So with the ground planes on, it looks a bit messy. Let's just do a 3D view first of how it looked in KiCad. 
So some of the com 3D components haven't loaded, but the general idea looks like this. So we to the final product. We already talked about the schematic, then choosing physical parts and how the PCB layout. So the way I've sectioned the board is I have my high power section over here, or the power section over here, which includes the battery input connector, the server connectors, which are eight of them. Then I have my main buck regulator over here with a large inductor, decoupling or filtering capacitors, a large heat dissipating uh, current sense resistor. This is 0 0.01 ohms, so I can measure a fair amount of current. And just some, sort, some, some test points over here. So I've got a ground, 3.3 volts and 5 volt, which I can easily access with a multimeter to check are the basic voltages correct. Okay, so this is the power section. Then there are several sections here. So this is the navigation computer. So it's an STM32F4. The various sensors are scattered around it. I've got some indicator LEDs to tell me the status, if there's a faulty sensor, if there's a GPS fix, or if it's calibrating. Then the larger STM32H7 is over here, surrounded by the flash memory, EEPROM, and again, various LEDs to indicate what's actually going on at a quick glance. All the connectors, as you can see, are at the edge of the board. I've chosen micro, um, I think the Molex Pico blade connectors. They're fairly small and seem to work very well. Also an SMA connector, so this is the only RF-ish section on the board. The trace from the SMA connector to the GPS unit or GPS receiver is a 50 ohm trace. That's why you have to pay attention. But other than that, there's not very much RF going on at all. Some other key things are the two programming connectors, USB connectors, which go to the navigation and flight control computers. They have differential USB traces. These are basically just USB to UART or UART to USB converters feeding into these USB connections. I have serial wire debug connectors here. These are the standard 10 pin headers. Other than that, they're um, boot mode selector switches. And yeah, that's about it. So I've sectioned the board in a way that there's power, one of the controller computers and one of the control computers, and otherwise the connectors are all outside and they have mounting holes as well. And again, this is a, this is a four layer board. So the majority of signals are at the top and the bottom layers and the two inner layers are used primarily for ground and power planes. So some special points as well. Um, the crystal oscillators are here and here. So you might be able to see kind of where it's etched out. This is a special region of the board where no other signals other than the oscillator signals are rooted underneath or anywhere close to this, these oscillators. The, the loading capacitors of the oscillators, these and these and over here, they are placed as closely as possible to the to the oscillator. We also have a feed resistor into, into the crystal, uh, which I calculated using the help of the data sheets. So you can figure out kind of via, via the data sheet of the crystal and what the manufacturer recommends for the microcontroller, you can calculate an appropriate value of the, of the feed resistor. So that was another critical thing to pay attention to. Um, other than that, the, I think it's a, it's a it looks a bit complicated, but it's a fairly straightforward design if you stick to the manufacturer's recommendations and you kind of have a little, or quite a good idea of where you want to put things, so things don't overlap and traces don't, don't cross and so forth. So where I have the large current coming in from the battery, instead of laying thick traces, I've essentially defined a copper pause to act as a really thick traces. And that's what I've done here and here as well. I have a 3.3 volt plane in the middle of the board on one of the layers and the 3.3 volt regulators over here and instead of just having one wire go down I have a set of a lot of wires feeding 3.3 volts into that whole ground plane, or into that power plane, sorry. Um, once you've essentially done all the routing, so the routing is fairly straightforward, route the most important parts first, the RF lines, the crystal oscillators, the the USB traces, root them first, and then root all the, in quotes, less important parts. 
at the end I've placed quite a few stitching vias so all these kind of uh, uh, grouped vi uh, vias with ground they're just to make sure the copper pores on the top the ground copper pore on the top is nicely connected to the inner layers and that you're you're minimizing um, the pedants or any ground loops that might occur if you have long ground traces.